Okay. We'll let folks log in. Okay. Good evening, thank you for joining us. My name is Dr. Michelle Tovar and I am, I am the Director of Public Engagement. I'm messing up my title already. <laughs> Before we begin, we ask that you please submit your questions for our guests in the chat or Q&A box. Tonight's program is in correlation with the exhibit with Stan, Latinx Art in Times of Conflict. This juried exhibition created by Gabi Magana and Rosano Orlando investigates the idea of resistance and its multiple ramifications in the visual arts, as well as the impact of political and or social conflict on the creative process. We are honored to host tonight's guest, Dr. Taina Caracol. Dr. Caracol joined the National Portrait, Portrait Gallery in 2013 as the first curator for the Latino art and history. And in 2015, her role was expanded to curator of painting and sculpture. Caracol has led the effort in, to increase the representation of Latino historical figures and artists at the museum adding over 170 portraits to the collection and ensuring that Latino contributions to American history and art are interwoven through the museum's exhibitions and permanent collection. Caracol earned her PhD in art history from the Graduate Center City University of New York. Her dissertation, Boom and Dust, The Rise of Latin American and Latino Art in New York Exhibition Venues and Auction Houses, 1970s through 1980s, examined the incubating role of New York City's alternative museums and art spaces and market during the Latin American art boom of the 1980s, of the late 1980s, excuse me. Caracol has published essays on Latino and Latin American artists and has also written on the importance of our arch archival preservation in contributing to a better understanding of the history of Latino and Latin American art in the United States. She holds an MA in French Studies from Middlebury College and a BA in Modern Languages from the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras, where she graduated magna cum laude. Thank you again for joining us, Dr. Caracol. Thank you very much, Dr. Tovar. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I am very grateful to Dr. Michelle Tovar for the invitation to speak here in conjunction with the exhibition with Stan Latinx Art in Times of Conflict. I want to congratulate all the artists in the show and also the co-curators, Gabi Mangana and Rosana Orlando. I'm delighted to be participating in this program because following Dr. Tovar's work, I know that this museum is committed to an expansive view of history that includes Latinx people and artists. Many of the other guest speaking invitations I received stem from my unusual role at the National Portrait Gallery as curator of Latinx art and history. Because why? Because it's a, it's a position that is rare to find. And something else that is rare to find is an institution that prioritizes Latinx art. So um, there are very few of us out there and scholars and curators such as E. Carmen Ramos, Arlene Davila, Chon Noriega, and myself have written about the longstanding absence or the extreme marginality of Latinx art in US museums. So here I'm not talking about Latin American art, which has a strong footing and a robust philanthropic tradition that has facilitated its presence in museums such as MoMA in New York and the Tate Modern in London, to mention a few. What I am talking about is art made by artists who are identified as Latinx or Latino or Hispanic people of Latin American background who have been born or raised in the United States who are descendants of people who didn't necessarily cross the border, maybe the border crossed them, people who are permanently here. For decades, grassroots organizations and culturally specific museums, such as the National Museum of Mexican Art in Chicago and Museo del Barrio in New York, Galeria de la Raza in San Francisco and the National Hispanic Cultural Center, to mention just a few, and that last one is in Albuquerque, have created a space for Latinx art in the American cultural landscape through their dedicated focus and efforts. 
but few museums that cover the large span of US American or Western art or history include Latinx stories and artists in their collections and exhibitions. And the same happens if you go to Latin America, the reverse happens, um, better said. Artists of Latino background, that, that means artists of US Latino background are nowhere to be found. They brillan por su ausencia, as we say in Spanish. So all of these, you know, this preamble is to say that I am happy to be collaborating with the Holocaust Museum Houston, which in its mission to educate people about the Holocaust and illuminating stories of social justice, recognizes the power of telling a broad story that sheds light on the struggle of Latinx people for a more just society. And this is evident in shows such as Dolores Huerta, Revolution in the Fields, which uh, was circulated by the Smithsonian Traveling Exhibition Service and opened in November of 2019. Um, at the museum, and uh, that's a show where I was involved. I, I curated the original show at the National Portrait Gallery from which that second exhibition stemmed. And unfortunately, I couldn't be at the, at the opening in Houston, but I heard it was fantastic. And also this current exhibition of withstand Latinx art in times of conflict. So, I feel here that I am collaborating with the museum as a peer. Dr. Tovar asked me to talk about curating Latinx art at the, at the national institution where I work. So that's what I will be speaking about tonight. Uh, Dr. Tovar, if I could have the first slide, please. Thank you. Do we see it here? Yes, we see it. I just, uh, okay, perfect. So I joined the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery eight years ago as the first curator of Latino art and history. And the National Portrait Gallery is one of the 19 museums that comprise the Smithsonian Institution, which is the largest museum complex in the world. The Portrait Gallery itself was authorized by an act of Congress in 1962 as a museum to exhibit and collect the portraits of people who have shaped the history of the United States and also to promote the art of portraiture. Our collections and exhibitions address the intersection between national history, biography, and portraiture. And Whereas we were authorized by an act of Congress in 1962, we opened our doors in 1968 at the site of the old patent office building in Washington DC. And this is the image you see here. Although we house portraits of individuals who've distinguished themselves in all fields of endeavor, including science, art, entrepreneurship, social activism, education, the military, we are mainly known for our signature permanent exhibition. And if I can have the next slide, please. So that signature permanent exhibition is America's Presidents, which is the only complete collection of presidential portraits outside the White House and the only one available to the public all year around. People from, come from around the country and the world to see that exhibition and to stroll through our galleries and approach US, US history through portraiture. I took full conscience of this the day before my job interview in 2013, when I went for a tour of the museum so that I could prepare mentally for the next day. And what I found as a Puerto Rican, as a Latina, as a scholar of Latino art was mainly absence for, my, for the cultural group that I am part of. For a museum of national history, the narrative had very few Latinos in it. If I can have the next slide, please. Thank you. Two of them were labor leaders, Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta in Alfredo Arreguin's portrait, Return to Aztlán. Another was Joan Baez and another, the actress Raquel Welch. But you really had to look hard to find them. And except for that portrait by Arreguin, the brilliance of Latino artists was also absent. One could have inferred that portraiture was not an art form which, with which they engaged. 
our permanent exhibition of the early of early American history, which was then titled American Origins, did not include Latinos. There was no allusion to their foundational presence in this country, or if there were works alluding to it, it was through a Euro-American point of view. If I can have the next slide, please. The Texas War of Independence and the Mexican-American War, for example, were and still are represented rather superficially by the figures of Stephen Austin, Samuel Houston, and Zachary Taylor. Next slide, please. All of them are crucial to that history, but where is the side that alludes to the Hispanic background of that region? For someone like me, born and raised in Puerto Rico, an island that became a US unincorporated territory in 1898 and whose population in the continental US now surpasses that of the island itself, there was nothing in the museum that pointed to this complicated political relationship or to the diaspora it has engendered. Next slide, please. The next day when my interview panel finished their questions, I was then asked if I had any questions of my own. And I did ask, why do you want a curator of Latino art? There doesn't seem to be room for any. And Brandon Fortune, our then chief curator who retired uh, last year, replied precisely, we know our collection and display are far from what they should be in terms of Latinx representation. And we want to change that. So I took on the job and I became part of a cohort of curators dedicated to illuminating the history of art and Latinos through the Smithsonian. And this cohort was made possible by the Latino Curatorial Initiative, which was an initiative directed by Eduardo Diaz. It is still, it is still ongoing. Um, and it's an initiative that intends to place curators dedicated to Latino art, Latino history, Latino culture through the many museums of the Smithsonian. And as I said at the beginning, there are 19 of them. So uh, I think today there have been 10 of those positions created. If I can have the next slide, please. And how did that initiative even take place? Well, it was in response, you know, as part of a ongoing decades long response to a report that was issued in 1994, commissioned by Smithsonian itself of, uh, the pre on the presence of Latinos through the institution in its collections, in its exhibitions, in its staff, uh, it, among its uh, leadership. And these were, uh, here you have in the slides, the, the conclusions of the study, which was aptly titled Willful Neglect, and which essentially said that Latinos were crassly underrepresented through the museum. That led to the creation of the Smithsonian Latino Center. And it has led to uh, an organism that, or an office that supports everything uh, of supporting Latino presence through the institution, uh, through pools of funds, through, moral and intellectual support. And it's, uh, it's just a wonderful community of museum professionals and uh, people who are committed to the representation of, of Latinx art, history, and culture. So as I took on my job, I had to delineate my curatorial strategy, which means what I wanted to collect, exhibit, write about. I started researching the collection Next slide, please. Some gems that I found included a photograph by Matthew Brady of the Venezuelan born and New York raised Teresa Carreño, attesting to her precocious musical talents, which led to a prestigious international career as a pianist and opera singer in the late 19th and early 20th century. Another was a collection of 90 portraits by the Cuban born Jose Maria Mora, one of the premier photographers of New York society in the late 19th century and the city's theater and also a photographer of the city's theater scene. So you, here you see his portrait of Buffalo Bill um, you know, in full garb, right? Yet 
In volume, it was clear that Latinos were massively underrepresented in the museum. In a collection of 22,000 objects, and that was then, today we have over 25,000, portraits of Latinx historical figures by Latinx artists comprise less than 1%. And so I remember seeing those statistics and uh, being absolutely alarmed. But then I decided to inquire about other groups that had been historically marginalized. And it turned out that they were also very much underrepresented, abysmally so. Native Americans and Asian Americans comprise less than 2% of our collection. African Americans then comprise something like 5%. And all of those percentages have increased, but if you can think of you know, a collection of, of, of several uh, dozen thousand objects, it takes time to move the needle and to increase those percentages. Women also made up less than a quarter of our collection then. And there are various reasons for these. And if we uh, could see one another, if we were not on seminar mode, I would love to have a conversation with you about this, you know, and to ask, okay, what do you think are the reasons? So, you know, one of the reasons is that there are traditional biases to history, right? Those same groups I mentioned have been uh, very much underplayed. Their contributions have been underplayed in history. They haven't been appropriately documented. But perhaps our biggest obstacle, particularly as it refers to oil on canvas portraiture before the 20th century, is that the genre was, the genre has an elite tradition. In early American art, portraiture was a genre that represented mainly white men who owned land. It's not until the advent of photography in 1839 that we start seeing some diversity in that genre. And through the 20th century, uh, when you have artists who willingly make a point of documenting and portraying people outside the dominant social groups. So why is a position like mine important? Why do we need more Latinx representation in museums? There's more than one reason why Latinos should have significantly more than a minimal presence at the National Portrait Gallery. Since 2010, we, they have comprised the largest minority in the nation. In 2018, they comprised almost 60 million people, according to the US Census. And by 2025, it is expected that one in five people in the country will identify as Latino. Yet, demographics are not the only rationale for our museum presence, or even the most important. To me, it is a question of historical accuracy. Latinos have been part of this country for centuries. All the building blocks of Latino identity the First Nations, the Spanish colonizers, merchant, missionaries, the Africans who endured the Middle Passage are foundational to this country. When the pilgrims arrived from England aboard the Mayflower, parts of this land already spoke Spanish too. Furthermore, from the moment the United States became its own political entity in 1776, Latinos have been part of its social and cultural fabric. As Juan Gonzalez has documented in Harvest of Empire, a history of Latinos in America, the origins of their presence are inextricably linked to the expansionist rhetoric of Manifest Destiny and the Monroe Doctrine, which in the wake of the 19th century wars of independence in most of Latin America, asserted the need for US intervention in case of any interference or colonizing efforts from Europe in the new republics. The Mexican-American War, by which Mexico lost 55% of its lands to the United States, and the Spanish-American War, through which the US gained control of the Philippines, Guam, and Puerto Rico, were two conflicts that resulted in the incorporation in various degrees of Latino groups into the na nation's political body. And he, here I have to plug in uh, an exhibition in which I'm working on with my co-curator, Dr. Kate LeMay, titled 1898 US Imperial Visions and Revisions, which is um, which will open in 2023 to mark the 125th anniversary of the Spanish American War and that moment of uh, US expansion beyond 
the continental frontier overseas. Um, so that's a show that I'm working on currently. I won't be speaking about it tonight more than I have already, but please stay tuned because it will be a really illuminating and fantastic show about a chapter of US history that's not very well known here. In addition to the Mexicans that became US citizens overnight in 1848, and the Puerto Ricans who achieved that status in 1917, just in time to be enlisted as soldiers in World War I, numerous workers, merchants, and intellectuals from Latin America traveled to the US in the 19th century voluntarily to take part in the economic and cultural life of cities like New York, New Orleans, and Tampa, Florida, for example, which was, and that cultural and economic life was in turn interlinked interlinked with that of their own countries. The Latino population has consistently grown through the 20th century due to a myriad reasons that include changes in US immigration quotas that have been um, between the 1940s and 70s that have gradually transformed the immigrant composition of the country from a predominantly European one to one that is predominantly Latin American and Asian. Periods of instability, political strife, in Latin America have resulted also in migration waves here. And there we can mention the Mexican revolution, the Cuban revolution, um, the Salvadorian civil war, and the current political crisis in Venezuela for the last 20 years. At the same time, looking at the other side of the coin, the United States has had also a very strong political, economic, and or military presence at times in many countries of Latin America through the 20th century and until the present. So there's a two-way relationship here to document with through portraiture. And I have to say also that speaking as an art historian, my goal is to not only document history, but to document art history, to make sure that Latino or Latinx artists become better known to our audiences, that they become part of the national and international discourse of modern and contemporary art that has overlooked them for so long. That audiences get a chance to see their brilliance, the wide variety of artistic strategies that, that they employ in their work, their, their themes, the incredible stylistic variety that there is to them and the irreducible character really of their cultural production. You know, it's impossible to say this is what Latino art looks like. Latino art or Latinx art looks like many, many different things, right? And so in a context where people of Latinx background are so fundamental historically, so numerous, so diverse, absence in our galleries is anything but neutral or painless. In a museum whose mission is to narrate US history, history through portraiture, absence could be equal, equated with ignorance about our presence and historical contributions, or worse, with their suppression through calculated invisibility. I should also mention that even though this is not part of the of, of of my curatorial work per se, um, our fantastic director, Kim Sayet, has had since 2013 the goal of having a bilingual institution. And so we, uh, shortly as she announced this goal, we started translating every temporary exhibition. And it has taken us years, but we're finally through the later stages of having translated the full permanent exhibitions of the National Portrait Gallery as well. And that is an incredible gesture that adds to everything that we're doing to portray Latinos in the country, to portray that, to give presence to that community. And uh, people appreciate it very much. Our audiences appreciate it very much. Since I've been at the Portrait Gallery, I've endeavored to make sure that the history of the nation that you see in our museum, its past and present, and present reflects the integral role of Latinos in shaping our country. And this is something that is ideally done through acquisitions so that the artworks can permanently be under our stewardship and we can maximize their, maximize their contexts of display 
and make them central to our museum narrative. So I've collected something like over 200 new portraits since 2013. But purchasing artworks is not always possible. Sometimes artworks are not in the market. They belong to important public or private collections already. And in that case, what we do is that we, we do our best to try to borrow them and bring them on loan to the museum. So in the following slides, I will be discussing some of the artworks that the museum has either brought on, on loan or collected. Um, everything that doesn't say loan is an artwork that, that we have collected in the, since 2013. And, and this will allow you to see how we have been sketching the contours of the Latino experience and speaking to its cultural multiplicity and its social and geographic variety. Next slide, please. So one of the artworks that I've been incredibly uh, proud to bring to our museum precisely because of that absence of of Latino figures in our galleries devoted to early American history was this portrait of Juan Nepomuceno Seguin, uh, which is permanently on view at the Texas State Capitol. And we brought it on loan in 2015. Seguin was a prominent politician and hero of the Texas War of Independence, who had been alcalde or city magistrate of San Antonio prior to the war. He was the only survivor of the Alamo battle and was instrumental in winning the Battle of San Jacinto, which won independence from Mexico. However, after the war, tensions did not dissipate between Mexico and the Republic of Texas. And Seguin, uh, as someone of Hispanic background, as someone who spoke Spanish, was constantly under suspicion. And he was accused of espionage in the 1840s while serving as mayor of San Antonio. And he had to flee to Mexico where he was forced by the government to fight on their side during the Mexican-American War. So he's really considered a foundational figure of Chicano history. Um, he sometimes is spoken about as the first Chicano, the first person to, um, to be in that situation of having a bicultural uh, cult, bicultural background and and being neither from here nor from there and being a stranger in both places. Next slide, please. Then there is this artwork that I'm also absolutely proud to have brought on loan and it's still on view. We have had it for five years. This is a portrait of Luis Munoz Marin by Francisco Rodon. It's one of the most iconic works of Puerto Rican art. Luis Muñoz Marin was the first governor elected by popular vote in Puerto Rico in 1948. And he's a key figure if we think about, the, about Puerto Rican political history and about the relationship between the island and the United States and its diaspora as well. Because in, as part of his government, he launched an economic program to transform the island from an agrarian to an industrial economy. And uh, that resulted in a vast um, amount of Puerto Ricans who worked in the agrarian sector having to move to the United States in search of employment. It did modernize the economy in Puerto Rico, but it also had a, a cost and that was um, a huge diaspora that came to live in cities like New York, Chicago, Hartford in the 19, late 1940s and 1950s. Next slide, please. The next few, the next um, few works are all acquisitions. And, and again, you know, every time I see one of these slides, I'm like, oh my God, another, another work of which I'm enamored that I was able to bring into the museum. It's really a great opportunity to be able to collect from artists who are, um, who are still creating incredible art and who have been important, important in Latino art history, but who are still making their mark. And so this is a fantastic uh, acrylic on canvas portrait of Ruben Salazar by Rupert Garcia. 
Rupert Garcia is a veteran artist of the Chicano movement. And Ruben Salazar was um, the first Mexican-American journalist to, have a, to be employed by a major newspaper, the LA Times, in the late 1960s. And um, he gave, while well, working for the LA Times, he gave voice to the plight of Chicanos and to their limited and social, uh, limited economic and social opportunities, the, the discrimination they faced as Mexican Americans. Um, and in 1970, while covering the Chicano moratorium, which was a huge protest against um, the huge numbers of Chicanos that were being sent, drafted to the war. Um, he was killed by a tear gas canister uh, launched by the police while he was in a private space at a bar, uh, resting up and having a drink, refreshing himself from covering the event. And so this was a, a pivotal moment of the Chicano movement. Ruben Salazar became a, a martyr of the movement and there are many portraits made by different artists depicting him. This portrait was the centerpiece of an exhibition in his honor. So it's very significant historically. If I can have the next slide, please. Then we have another fabulous portrait that I love by artist Antonio Martorell. This one of Puerto Rican, New York born Puerto Rican writer, Nicolas Amor, who is also one of the first Latina writers to have been published by a mainstream publishing house. She's very well known for her short stories uh, around life, Latino life in New York, Puerto Rican life in New York, in El Barrio. In fact, Lin Manuel Miranda has mentioned her stories as one of his literary influences in his own work. And I love the spirit of this painting because Nicolasa has a very vibrant personality and you and it absolutely comes across here. Next slide, please. Then you have Antonia Pantoja, social leader, education leader. She started off as a labor organizer. Well, she migrated from Puerto Rico in the 1940s. She uh, had a degree as an educator, but when she moved to New York as part of that diaspora, of, of the 40s and 50s, she took on jobs in factories and she realized that everyone who was there who didn't speak English was taken advantage of. And she started organizing the workers as she had learned from her grandfather who had raised her in Puerto Rico. And she uh, eventually left uh, the, the world of factories to pursue a degree in, in social work. Um, earning a doctorate and eventually getting um, involved in education activism. She created the Association Aspira, which is a nation today. It started as a New York based uh, organization, but today it's a nationwide organization for educational achievement that fosters excellence amongst Latino youth and youth of color. And, and her aim in creating that organization initially in the, in the 60s was to, um, to respond to the huge dropout rate of Latinos and Puerto Ricans and African-Americans in the city school system of New York. If I can have the next slide, please. Okay. Then we have Silvia Rivera, the Venezuelan Puerto Rican leader who as a militant of the movement that was generated by the Stonewall riots, and also as a militant of the Young Lords organization. And the Young Lords was an organization inspired by the Black Panthers who fought for the well being and the empowerment of the Puerto Rican community in. Um, in New York, but not only in New York, also there were chapters in the original chapter was in Chicago, there, there was a chapter in Philadelphia. And so they fought for the, their communities there. And Silvia Rivera as someone active with them and also someone who had been, um, you know, had come of age politically with the Stonewall riots, 
fought for the rights of transgender people and people of color like herself within the LBGTQ movement. And she's a person at the center there. Next slide, please. Then we have Bolivian math teacher Jaime Escalante. If you haven't seen Stand and Deliver, please do. It's a wonderful film where James, Edward James almost plays Jaime Escalante, the math teacher who also had a profound impact in national education when he insisted in giving, in, in teaching AP math to his high school students at, uh, at Garfield High School in Los Angeles. Students of which nothing was expected because the education system had a huge bias against Latino kids and against kids of color. And they just thought that they weren't smart enough for pre-calculus and calculus. And Jaime Escalante proved that that was that that was a racist preconception that had no foundation, that they were absolutely capable and deserving of that opportunity. Um, if I can have the next slide. Then we have the portraits of Big Papi, David Rodriguez, and of A. Rod or Alex Rodriguez uh, by Freddie Rodriguez. And these are part of a wonderful body of works by Freddy Rodriguez, who is considered the Dean of Dominican Art in the US. He's uh, an artist who's ha who has been here since the 1960s, uh, practiced many different styles, and has a series of paintings that pay homage to Dominicans in the major, in the major, in Major League Baseball. And these are two of them. And so here you see also, you know, the variety of artworks, of, of strategies, as I was saying at the beginning, that the artists employ, because these are paintings that use the silhouette of the athletic body of the artist, of the, not of the artist, of the, of the athlete, of the sportsman, in order to portray them. And so what you see is their physicality, their, their moves bat while batting, while, you know, beginning to run. Next slide, please. Artists, we, you know, another iconic portrait is that we have acquired is that of Dolores Huerta by Barbara Carrasco, a work that Barbara uh, wanted to create in order to make an iconic portrait of Dolores, a portrait that would stay with you and that remind and, and remind you of the of the crucial contributions of Dolores Huerta to the farm workers movement and to civil rights and to human rights in general. Um, and she did this through this beautiful pop inspired palette, you know, the close cropping, the proximity that you have to Huerta in this portrait is really outstanding and um, creates a very intimate and at the same time dynamic work of art. And if we can have the next slide, please. And here, this wonderful photograph of Celia Cruz, the queen of salsa, one of the main figures of the, uh, of the music label Fania and of the key figures of the Fania All-Stars, the, the group of artists that um, recorded with that label and that toured around the world in a photograph taken by Alexis Rodriguez Duarte and Tico Torres, who work as a team in Miami. And so, you know, these are just a fraction of the works that I've acquired in the last eight years. To give you a notion, again, of how much it takes to move the needle on a collection of 22,000 objects, and I spoke to that earlier, we've gone from less than 1% to something like 2%, you know? And, and so I think here, something that's really important is to, it is important to look at the numbers, at the percentages, at the, at the demographics of the collection, but it's even more important to look through the museum and to see if through the collection, through what's been acquired, 
the whole landscape of the museum, it's, it's, its whole environment is changing. And I think that is the case at the Portrait Gallery. Um, it's not that we have acquired lots of works that are in storage. They're being seen, they're being viewed, they are installed amongst the rest of our exhibitions and collections. They're making the cover of our publications. And that's something that, um, that changes people's perceptions, that teaches them about these artists and these historical figures, and that really makes a huge impact. Um, next slide, please. Another main avenue to expand the to expand the Latinx presence at the National Portrait Gallery has been through temporary exhibitions. So not just artworks collected or brought on loan, but exhibitions that have been that I have curated um, that highlight these historical figures. And one of them was One Life Dolores Huerta, organized in conjunction with the 50th anniversary of the Delano Grape Strike in 2015 and which was a show that was really important because it really brought to the fore Dolores Huerta as a national figure, as someone who in the words of Cesar Chavez himself had been co-architect of the movement with him and who until then um, hadn't received enough recognition. So I'm absolutely um, delighted that that show uh, was, was organized at the Portrait Gallery and that it's now traveling through its iteration, Dolores Huerta revolution in the fields. If I can have the next slide. The next couple of slides I will show are of time-based media works, which are works that have a durational aspect. Essentially it's, you know, so we can uh, think of a range of, of artworks that fall within that category, but in this case, it's going to be a video and an animation. Uh, the one I'm showing right now is the very, very moving portrait home by Vincent Valdez, an artist from San Antonio who is based in Houston um, and who I had uh, the immense pleasure of collaborating with in 2017 for an exhibition we organized at the Portrait Gallery titled The Face of Battle, Americans at War, 1911 to Now. And this show, examine the artistic response to the wars since 9-11, looking at the impact of the conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq through um, how families, American families and society um, endured them. And if I can, can you please play? Oh, well, I remember that terrible day when the blood stained the sand and the water and how in that hell that they call so lovely we were butchered like lambs at the slaughter johnny turkey was ready he primed himself well he shared us with bullets and he rained us with shells And in five minutes flat He'd blown us all to hell Nearly blew us right back to Australia And the band played waltzing Matilda So Vincent's gallery was dedicated to his lifelong friend, second Lieutenant John Holt, who survived his first tour of duty in Iraq in 2009, but succumbed to his battle with post-traumatic stress at home. And um, Vincent's whole gallery had a series of paintings um, honoring him. And then this video, which was installed at the center of the gallery and projected onto a wall so that the coffin seemed, was really life-size. Um, and the coffin floats, in the video, the coffin floats through the south side of San Antonio where the artist and Lieutenant Holt's friendship first blossomed and ends up, you know, 
arriving in front of his home at the end of the song, which uh, is a song by the Pogues, an anti-war song called, and the band played Walty Matilda. And this was an incredibly powerful work of art. One of the most powerful I've, I've experienced myself. And I noticed that it was the same for our audiences who would linger in that room for months and months and would come back just to see that work. Um, and if I can have the next slide, please. Another uh, recent development that has, that shows the impact of the work we're already doing in terms of representing Latinos is our triennial Outwin Buchiever Portrait Competition, which is a competition we do every three years uh, of portraiture. The call, you know, we, we launch an open call to artists who submit their work and there's four outside jurors and three jurors from within the institution who go through thousands of entries and distill a selection of 40 something that uh, comprise a final exhibition. And these are the finalists or the works, uh, the, the, the artists in that final show for 2019. And there was an unprecedented number of, of Latino artists who applied to that competition. And also an unprecedented number, nine of them out of 46 who got selected for that final show. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please. So here we, you see us in the act of juring, and I chose to highlight a work by Ruth Buentello, another artist from Texas. She's based in uh, San Antonio, and that's her work, Desaparecidos en el Rio Bravo. Next slide, please. And so you have an idea of, of our installation. And finally, next slide. And um, a wonderful outcome of this last triennial was that the first prize, which is a really big deal, you know, the first prize gets $25,000 and the opportunity to create a commission portrait for the museum. That first prize for the first time went to a Latino artist and that is Hugo Crossweight, who is based between San Diego and Tijuana with his portrait of Berenice Sarmiento Chavez. And we'll play that and then um, I think I'll conclude very quickly after that.
So that is the work of Ugo Crosswaite and the Outwing 2019 is opening on September 11 at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University, St. Louis. So stay tuned for some fabulous virtual programming. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to say that museums are institutions that generate knowledge and that have the power of legitimizing artistic productions, of saying, look at this, this matters, this is part of our history, this is part of our culture. And through their collecting and exhibition practices, they create narratives that can be exclusive, simplistic, colonialist, colonialist elitist, narrow-minded, or just the opposite, inclusive, liberatory, democratic, expansive, complex. And that is what I aspire to do with my work. It's a work in progress that never ends, but the responsibility towards my community and its artists is energizing and the possibility of making a difference in the fields of history and art history and making their canons and their narratives more comprehensive, more expansive is something that really keeps me going and that I appreciate very much. So thank you so much for listening. Okay. So we do have a few questions in our Q&A box from the audience. We do have someone that's asking, what are the most challenging and rewarding aspects of your job? Um, some of the, well, some of the most challenging. I, uh, I think it is challenging to be to, to want very hard to represent a certain history and not find a portrait that represents it, right? So what I was explaining at the beginning of, especially with historical portraiture, you know, how do we make sure that our early, uh, our, our exhibition on early US history is truly representative of the many cultural groups that were in the country as it was taking form. And frankly, there, you know, it's not that easy to find portraits of people of color or of Latinos, you know, in particular, at, you know, prior to the, to the advent of photography. And even through the advent of photography, it's not, it's not that easy to find 19th century portraits of them. So that is definitely a challenge. And some of the most rewarding acts, aspects, I think, have to do with contemporary artists, you know, artists who are, who have important things to say, who, who have, um, who have a contribution to make aesthetically and in terms of their, or their artistic vision and being able to facilitate the viewing of their work, being able to facilitate the, their vision taking shape in the museum space is, it's a thrilling thing. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Thank you. Someone is asking, what generated your interest in art history? Oh, that's a lovely question. Well, I was uh, very lucky to grow up in a family that had many, many artists surrounding it. Many, my my parents are not uh, people in the arts field. Um, mom is a university professor of, of, of French and my dad works uh, in public transportation and ecology, but they had many friends who were artists and I grew up going to their homes and you know, seeing their, their universe in terms of, you know, when you enter the home of an artist, who creates where he, in the, in the same space, space he, he or she inhabits, it can be quite a disorienting experience when you step into that world. And disorienting in the best sense you know, of the word really, but just you see a, a different reality that they, they're able to materialize. 
um, through their ideas and their work and their skill. And so I think that little by little um, directed me towards art history as a field of study. It's wonderful. We have a question, as an art educator, are there resources we can use to highlight Latinx narratives, experiences, or to provide a more inclusive view of US history? That's a great question. Well, the Smithsonian has a wonderful portal called the Smithsonian Learning Lab. Um, and I am happy to share the resource with you, um, Michelle, um, Dr. Tovar, but I think <laughs> we can That's be- fine. Yes, we can right. share that, that um, we'll send out that link with our follow-up with our email. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's an excellent resource that has lots of content related to our to artworks and to objects in the collections of Smithsonian, and also um, you know you you you'll find uh, historical facts. You'll find um, resources related to the arts. It's it's really a wonderful resource. Um, yeah, that is the one that really comes to mind as, as one of the great um, you know, resources of, of this moment. Now we do have one of our curators on, Rosana Orlando, and she's saying in the, in the chat, thank you very much. This was a fascinating presentation. As a Venezuelan, it was wonderful to see the picture of Teresa, and I cannot pronounce her, Karen, thank you. Thank you for including her and, ins and her inspiring story in your collection. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And, and yes, she, she was a major musician in, uh, in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And she was, you know, a prodigy child initially. Um, and uh, there is an important theater in Caracas that is named after her. So I am, when I discovered that work in our collection, I was thrilled that we had it. We have time for two, about two more questions. Uh, someone is asking, what advice would you give to students who are, are interested in pursue, pursuing this field of study? I think, um, you know, advice is just, there's so many things to explore within, within the field of art history. Uh, there's so much opportunity, um, whether you're someone who likes past history or history that is being made today, right, through contemporary art. And, um, and so, I think the advice is to try to, to find out what is, what is it that you like, keeping an open mind, you know, and, and keeping a, you know, an optic that doesn't reduce the possibilities. Also the possibilities of, of you know, very often artists are label labeled in all sorts of things you know latino is one thing for example which exists but you know yes we're talking about a, a huge cultural group here but but we don't want to use it in a way that reduces the aesthetic possibilities of that group that says oh this is what latino art looks like only you know you, we want we want to keep the category open another category is contemporary art you know people think that artists who are contemporary need to be under 35 and that's not the case. I know contemporary artists who are 80 something. And so think, you know, as you study art history and uh, think about those categories and about how useful or not they are, um, but just above all, think about the freedom that art provides and that uh, it should provide and the freedom that artists should have to create whatever they, there is to create. So in order to not to pigeonhole them. Thank you. And we're just out of time, but we do want to know where can we follow your work? Is there a website um, where we can see upcoming exhibitions or, social, or on social media? 
-hmm. Yes, thank you so much. So our website for the National Portrait Gallery is npg.si.edu. Um, and our upcoming exhibitions are always there, uh, advertised there. Also, uh, I encourage you to follow the Outwin Portrait Competition website. And the website is outwin.si.edu. So Outwin is O, um, so O U T W I N. I had just never spelled it. Uh, <laughs> I know how to spell it, but you know, without the pencil. Um, and so outwin.si for Smithsonian Institution.edu. And you will see also the program or the, the cycle of the exhibition, which is uh, the next one is opening or the, the next iteration 2022 is opening in April of next year. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for joining us this evening. It was an honor to host you and the incredible work you've been doing. You're a role model and I follow your work. So thank you again. Thank you to our guests and, and to our viewers for joining us tonight. The exhibit with Stan Latinx Art in Times of Conflict is now on view through October. Please visit our website at hmh.org to learn more. And as always, students K through 12 are always free at the museum. Our next summer free day is July 14th. Please join us then and also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Boniac Center and at HMHOU. Thank you again for tuning in. Have a good evening. Good night. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you.